All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. Um, I'm Claire Haley, uh, uh, Director of Media Communications and Coordinator of Author Talks here at Atlanta History Center. I'm so excited to be welcoming all of you here tonight uh, to hear Ed Tarkington talk about his newest book, The Fortunate Ones, with Morgan Babst. You can purchase the book directly from tonight's official bookseller, Acapella Books. There's a link to do so in the chat to the right of your screen, or you can find that same information on Atlanta History Center's website. During the discussion, if you have any questions for Ed and Morgan, you can submit those using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. They will get to as many of those as they are able to during the course of the event. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Ed Tarkington. Ed's debut novel, Only Love Can Break Your Heart, was an ABA Indies Introduced Selection, an Indie Next pick, a Book of the Month Main Club Selection, and a Southern Independent Booksellers Association bestseller. A regular contributor to Chapter16.org, his articles, essays, and stories have appeared in a variety of publications, including The Nashville Scene, Memphis Commercial Appeal, Knoxville News, and Lit Hub. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee. He is joined in conversation tonight by Morgan Babst, a native of New Orleans. Morgan has published essays and short fiction in the Washington Post, Devere, The Oxford American, and Garden and Gun, amongst many other publications. Her debut novel, The Floating World, was named one of the best books of 2017 by Kirkus, Amazon, Southern Living, and the Dallas Morning News. We were also fortunate to host Morgan for her book tour on The Floating World back in 2017. We're so excited to be hosting this discussion virtually with all of you here tonight, and I'll now turn it over to Morgan and Ed. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Claire. Um, and thank you to the Atlantic History, Atlanta History Center for having us. It's, it's so nice to be back, though I wish we were in that nice room instead of on Zoom. Um, I also wanted to say thank you so much to Ed for writing this spectacular novel. Um, I'm not sure that many books would have swept me off my feet to the degree to, the degree to which I, I spent all week lounging um, in Belle Mead by a pool in my mind, uh, rather than on Twitter. Um, especially last week. Um, this novel follows the ascent of Charlie, the son of a single mother who's cast out from her family into the wealthiest and most powerful circles of Nashville society, bringing up questions of selfhood and integrity, love, grief. Um, and it's incredibly engaging, almost seductive. Um, from the very first movement, in which Charlie turns away from the parents of a boy killed in the Middle East about whom we know nothing, to the television where he learns that his friend Arch, a senator from a rich family, has died by suicide. We know this book will call us to re-examine many of the fantasies we hold about America. He weeps in front of the parents of the soldier, then begins to tell the story, which is the book, of his relationship to this so-called great man who eventually founders on the rocks of his being a man um, there's a critique of the American dream implicit in this novel that goes along with this interrogation of the idea of greatness, um, the idea of a statesman, the idea of, um, of somebody who has risen to the top of things. I wonder whether that's, those, thing, those ideas are connected in your mind and, um, and what brought you to write about them. Um. Well, first of all, thank you, Morgan, for being here and, and doing this with me. I'm, I'm so very grateful and an admirer of yours for a long time. And um, it's just awesome and a privilege and honor to have you here with me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that <clears throat> where I really kind of started was uh, in a sense of, you know, trying to understand, as we have observed, you know, in, in, in smaller, what I consider to be sort of more dramatic ways than what we've experienced or, or, or more interesting ways than what we've experienced in the last, you know, year or two, and especially the last two weeks, how, you know, good people who have kind of been raised with this notion that, you know, they have a responsibility to, you know, uphold certain values or serve the public in a certain way and become great, who are raised and sort of indoctrinated or, or, or 
uh, uh, you know, uh, instilled with these ideals of, you know, what we call noblesse oblige, that, that you're, uh, if you, if, you know, to whom much is given, much is required, and, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, start out with really good intentions, and, and, and then gradually, as they, they go through life, and, and they ascend, uh, one thing or another comes along that, 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 sort of takes them to places where they never thought they were gonna have to go, uh, where they start to lose track of the difference between a kind of necessary evil and just a straight up wrong, and where they lose the capacity to you know, empathize with people who don't see the world the way that they do and who can't comprehend the way they see the world. Um, and so I kind of started there, but I also really wanted to go on the other side and show, okay, well, what is it about, you know, how does this, how does that world look, the world of people who, who you know, were kind of born into uh, wealth and, and the expectation of uh, an ascent to power and influence uh, to someone who has nothing, right? And who comes from nothing. And uh, if that person were to sort of sneak through the gates of the kingdom somehow uh, and find himself befriended by the prince, uh, you know, what would that do to him? And, and how would he uh, respond to that or, or, or anyone, he or she or they? Um, in fact, the, one of the, the original title that I wanted to use for this novel was um, Princes in the Tower, which I, I, I sort of you know, thought, you know, this is a little bit of a tower, right? And, and once you get in there, no matter what you want to do, you can't really necessarily see outside of that. You're sort of trapped by that. Um, and I didn't want to, I, I didn't want there to be a sense that one side or the other was pure uh, and that there was a right or a wrong uh, and that, uh, you know, I didn't want there to be any heroes or any villains really, because I feel like that's where we are as a culture, that the world has become so complex that those who seem to us as villains, you know, the problem with situations like the one we're in right now is when there's a very, very clear kind of wrong, it really sort of muddies the water. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't clarify things because it obscures the fact that what remains when you take out the clear right and wrong is, is a really gray world. And that was kind of the world that I wanted to show the grayness of, of the world that most of us are living in. Yeah. Um, I think you really accomplished that almost perfectly. Um, it, <clears throat> this, that idea is signaled from the very beginning with your epigraph from Robert Penn Warren, where, um, in All the King's Men, he writes, and what we students of history always learn is that the human being is a very complicated contraption and that they are not good or bad, but are good and bad. And the good comes out of the bad and the bad out of the good and the devil take the hindmost. Um, and as an elaboration of that idea, this, this novel is, is, is truly exquisite. And of course it does many, many other things besides. Um, the, um, both the writing and the um, and the storytelling here reminded me so much of All the King's Men, which is, as my dad says, um, he and I kind of both nudge each other every once in a while and say, "Have you have you gone back there for a refresher in your prose lately?" Um, we were talking about him the other day. In fact, um, that scene with the with the tennis racket is is my very favorite one where she's playing tennis. Um, I wonder um, if. Robert Penn Warren is has always been one of your um, one of your heroes, um, or how you see yourself in the tradition of Southern literature and American literature. What you see your role is now in the twenty first century, writing from the South. That's a good question. Um, thank you. I I'm one of those people. I managed. Uh, I was not assigned this book in high school. Uh, the, All the King's Men. And uh, you know all the the students 
that I know take, you know, it's like the, the kind of required book for AP English, but for some reason it didn't, it, it, and, and my sister read it the year before me, but for some reason it wasn't on my list. And then I, I it was on the list in a course that I took on Southern, on the, the Southern novel uh, when I was in college. And it kind of came along at a time when I, I, I probably should have really drenched myself in it. But of all the books that I read that semester, this was the one that I kind of cheated on a little bit and, and sort of skimmed and skipped and didn't really read carefully. So I didn't really, you know, I had a lot of knowledge, or I guess I'd learned a lot about the circle around Warren and the fugitives and, and you know, the agrarians and, and that whole kind of culture that which really was kind of centered in Nashville for a time. And uh, I hadn't but, but I hadn't read that novel carefully. It kind of intimidated me um, when I started to read it. It was so dense and uh, not dense in a, in, in a, a, a pejorative way, but you know, it, it was so richly written. And so I didn't really read it until I got to live here uh, when, when I moved here. And, and one of my good friends, uh, dear friends, lives next door to the widow of Alan Tate, who was one of Warren's teachers at Vanderbilt and a great poet of the of the fugitive group and, and a major influence on the new criticism, uh, which was kind of the, the vogue of literary criticism in the mid 20th century. And I was like, well, gosh, you know, I better go to school here. And, and, and I mean, I'm living in Nashville. I'm around Vanderbilt and a lot of people in that uh, world. And I'm kind of glad that I missed it when I was younger, because I think reading it through the eyes of, you know, a more mature adult, uh, uh, you know, with some experience in writing and a desire to learn, you know, from novels as a writer, uh, I saw so many things that I don't think I would have seen when I was younger. And it became a book that had, uh, and, and also Warren as a person because of the changes that he went through over the course of his literary career from being a kind of uh, Confederate apologist to being a more outspoken, really outspoken critic of uh, Southern culture and, and the intrinsic racism in it. Whereas, you know, before he'd literally been part of a, a group that wrote a book of essays called I'll Take My Stand, which is basically, you know, sort of saying we can, we can take the bad stuff out of the South and keep the good stuff. And by the end of his career, he realized, you know, no, you really can't do that. You have to acknowledge that the good stuff was enabled by the bad stuff. And I think that he, uh, you know, really got that across in, in All the King's Men. As far as my own position, I, I, I don't, I've been thinking a lot about this and writing some about it. Um, the whole idea of Southern literature is, is, is a fuzzy concept for me. And, and I think it's one that, you know, I, I don't, you know, Aside from the fact that that my novels and stories are set in the South, I, I know I don't consciously set out to write, you know, Southern stories, and I doubt you do either. I mean, that if if they're here, you kind of know that's inevitable, right? If 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 you're writing a novel about New Orleans, it's a Southern novel. You can't get around it. But I don't think about it. I didn't think about it in terms of, you know, trying to, you know find a place in that tradition. Certainly I've been very influenced by writers in that tradition, probably, you know, most of all uh, Walker Percy. Um, but it wasn't a conscious thing. And in fact, I think the thing about Percy that I admired the most was that he was, you know, writing a kind of novel that didn't feel like, like a Faulkner novel, you know, that, that it was set in the South, but it really had more in common with like Sartre, Camus than with, mm -hmm. you know, with Faulkner. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really intend to do that, but what I've come to realize is that it's just, it's kind of impossible not to do that if you are a Southerner and you're writing about uh, southern situations, and particularly if you're writing about the type of culture that I'm writing about here, which is, you know, just inextricably, you know, the 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 the, the privilege and the noblesse oblige and the entitlement are are you know 
that is Southern whiteness, right? And uh, something that I myself as a Southerner, not nearly as privileged as this character in my novel, but, but certainly you know, raised comfortably, took for granted. And uh, I wanna kind of engage that, I do think, I, whether I knew I was doing that or not, I, I, I wanted to engage that, the sort of, you know, uh, the burden of, of Southerness, which now feels even more, you know, kind of difficult to manage as, you know, recent events have really highlighted how still deeply entrenched these ideas are that really kind of go back to the causes of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Something that your novel does so well, I think, is exactly what you say, is that it takes these ideas that have been traditionally seen to be Southern problems and pushes them up against America and shows them to be American problems writ large. Um, it's interesting that you bring up Walker Percy. The, um, I've actually been reading and rereading and rereading the movie goer all year this year. Um, uh, and also it, in conversation with Kate Chopin's The Awakening, which I think that he was, um, he was kind of inverting in a way. Um, I, I think of Kate Chopin as being sort of the, the original existentialist novelist. Um, she was so way ahead of her time, wasn't she? Oh my gosh, she was amazing. You know, a feminist existentialist living on Esplanade Avenue in a fancy Creole house. Um, but the um, but as Walker Percy shows us, you know, ideas about America through the lens of New Orleans, you seem to show us a lot about America through the lens of Nashville, and. You know, even, you know, having read A Place to Come to and, and many other, you know, some other Nashville books, I don't think that I've ever read a book that takes me so clearly into the summers that I spent riding horses in Franklin and hanging <laughs> out by like very fancy pools in Leaper's Fork. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering what it is about Nashville that motivated you to write this book that is so steeped in this particular and strange and, and rarely seen um, side of it. Well, maybe that's why, because I think it's so rarely seen. At the time that I started, uh, Nashville was already in the midst of being, you know, crowned its city by the New York Times and many other publications. And, you know, it seemed like every week there was a new article in a major national news publication you know, centered in, you know, the left or the right coast, celebrating Nashville and describing it. And it became kind of a joke for those of us who live here, like this, you know, fantastic, you know, burger and soda shop would open up and we'd all go down there and be like, oh God, I hope they don't write about this in the New York Times because the second they do, you know, we'll all have to wait two hours to get a burger and I'm not standing <laughs> in line for two hours. I don't care if it's the best hamburger in the universe. I'm not standing in line for a hamburger. Uh, and then they made a TV show about it. And, and, you know, I, I remember watching it and just thinking, everybody just seems like they're just missing it. This is not, the wheels of power in this town do not revolve around Music Row. And I mean, most people don't even realize that the music industry isn't even close to being the most uh, profitable or, or, or the biggest employer in this city. It's healthcare by, you know, a thousand miles yeah. and uh, the culture here is not 10 gallon hats and cowboy boots, at least not amongst the people who call the shots. And I've had some exposure to that uh, through various outlets. And I, so I kind of started out thinking, well, I'd like to, you know, kind of correct this false image of, of how things go in Nashville and tell a story about the people that I think are the most interesting and fascinating, uh, who really are much more, you know, they're definitely not shucks and y'all, they're, they're, they're sophisticated and, and highly educated and extremely wealthy and uh, powerful and influential and, and invested in, in, you know, in politics. And, 
then I began to think about it more and I realized that, you know, particularly living through a hotly contested mayoral election in 2015 between a progressive transplant and someone who grew up here uh, who, you know, was kind of representative of the, the conservative side that Nashville and, and all the transitions and the changes that had been going through over the past 30 years had sort of become a bit of a flashpoint, maybe a bellwether for what was going on in the country. And I couldn't think of a city that had gone through such dramatic change in terms of the, the, the speed of growth. It was something that had already happened in Atlanta, really probably happened in Atlanta in the 60s uh, or the 70s at the latest, where, you know, the, the, the welcoming of outside businesses and, and, and employers just bringing a lot of people from out of state to live there changed the demographics of Atlanta so profoundly that it began to lose, you know, that it, it became a different place. And that was happening while I was living here or really kind of reaching its crescendo. Uh, and and, and the, the bitterness of that 2015 mayoral election uh, really, sort of synthesized that for me, that there was this, this kind of real fight between, you know, uh, the preservation of the old sort of structures of power and the influence of people who didn't grow up here. And then it suddenly occurred to me that this was, you know, when, when as the years passed and the national situation got more intense, I was like, well, this is, you know, this is the story of America right now. And if you were going to try and do that in one place, you couldn't have a better place to do it. Yeah. Oh. It's something that happened in New Orleans too, after mm -hmm. Katrina, not to the same extent, but that yeah. we, um, you know, we had a huge influx of, of people from elsewhere who moved in and, and overtook places that were really cultural hearts of the city. And um, now that they look like Brooklyn, um, and so it's, it's kind of, you know, it's hard to know, it's hard to know where the, where the center is anymore. Um, and it's, it's always a, um, a socioeconomic problem and also a racial problem. And I'll bring in a question here from the comments because it's relevant. Um, Alex Thomas would like to know, um, if you could discuss how you balanced, um, race in the novel and how you went about researching that. It was um, something very, very interesting to me to see um, both, both sides, like both sides of that coin there, the very, very, very affluent, and then um, the, um, the dispossessed. Um, it was tricky. Um, I, I think one thing that uh, helped was that, um, you know, I don't anymore, but I lived in East Nashville, which was described in the novel for about 10 years. And, you know, I lived in a very, you know, integrated neighborhood and, and I had a real keen sense of the cost of gentrification for my neighbors. And I had a real kind of sense of a, a kind of, you know, a guilt about the fact that, you know, I was a gentrifier, you know, I, I mean, people kind of called each other pioneers, but we weren't pioneers, we were gentrifiers, you know, and, and oh, like, makes you wonder um, what the word pioneer meant. Oh, I know. And, and that was <laughs> very, you know, like, I just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth and, and the weird sort of kind of cluelessness of a lot of, you know, very hip, highly educated white people that were you know, you know, overtaking these neighborhoods and driving up the property taxes so that, you know, the elderly grandmother who lives next door to me is you know, struggling. And I'm, you know, I can't dis dissociate myself from that. So it hit me in the heart and I, 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 you know, I became very sensitive to that issue. I also felt, and I'd taken some criticism after my first novel for, you know, not as not not directly engaging the the, the realities of, of race in the world that I was describing. And I, I, I didn't necessarily agree with that, but I took the criticism to heart and and I thought, okay, you can't tell this story 
about the difference between the privileged and, and the dispossessed without acknowledging, you know, that segregation and uh, entrenched socioeconomic racism and, you know, all of the other kind of conditions that exist in cities like Nashville and New Orleans and Atlanta, much less so in Atlanta now, I think, than in the past, but still. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to do that. But I also knew that I don't have a lot of authority on this subject because, you know, you know I'm a white guy, you know, from a fairly privileged background. I originally kind of, you know, I sort of wanted to tell the story of what it's like for an extremely, because I've had this experience with students of mine when I teach in a prep school similar to the one in the novel, uh, you know, boys, African-American boys from, you know, very, very poor backgrounds coming into a school like this where they're classmates with these boys whose grandparents are literally billionaires. And, you know, neither one of these, like the, 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 the wealthy boys are incredibly welcoming and kind and loving to these kids. They're, they don't, they, they want to be liked by these boys. They're, they're not, prejudiced and, and I mean there surely there's some but for the most part what I see is you know but but they're totally clueless about like what these kids lives are like and how mind-boggling it is to think that this is how people actually live I remember once driving a, a bus for a wrestling tournament and there was a boy uh, on the bus with us who who was a, a financial aid kid from a pretty rough neighborhood and we were driving down Bellamy Boulevard and he was looking out the window and he's like is that a house I was like, what do you mean is that a house? He's like, you mean, does somebody live there? I'm like, look at that one. He just, it, he'd never seen it before. And I was like, you never, you never been over here before? And he's like, you know where I live? And it, it was just so awe striking, striking to him. And it just kind of struck me like, wow, how hard it must be and how strange it must be. And I felt it, it was a real epiphany for me. I hadn't thought about it that before. And I felt shame that I hadn't. And, but I, I was like, you know, I can't write from the perspective of an African American boy. That, that would be, you know, really overstepping my boundaries. And so I really struggled to figure out, okay, but then I got this idea of thinking about Terrence, who's Charlie's friend that he grows up with before he you know, ends up in this, this world uh, with Arch and, and, and the wealthy. And thinking about Terrence as being someone who was sort of like, uh, you know, like, like a yin and yang with Arch in some ways, just as gifted, just as charismatic, just as talented, but not born into this track where, you know, it was all laid out for him and not set up in life the way uh, that Arch had been. And that if I handled it delicately enough that, you know, I could sort of introduce that, that contrast about how different their lives are, these equally talented, beautiful, charismatic fellas, uh, but born with different prospects because of the realities of race and the vast differences in their uh, economic status. And all I can hope is that I handled it delicately enough. I have to give a lot of credit to, to my editor, Kathy Pores, who's really awesome. And, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time working together on some of the scenes and, and aspects of that particular issue and that character, but I wanted to be honest about it without being exploitative and without uh, telling a story that doesn't belong to me. And I, I, all I can hope is that, um, you know, people will, will see it as I intended it to come across. I think Terrence is a wonderful character and I really appreciated how much power you gave him. Um, I think that that's, that was, you know, absolutely necessary in this world where it sort of feels like Arch is the only one with any power. Terrence also has a lot of power. Um, 
the um the, all the characters in the book are just they're so well drawn um i was listening to it as i was wandering around frantically clean, cleaning the house to keep from looking at the television um and every time every time arch says bud <laughs> i had this like visceral flashback to my prom date who grew up in a mansion on Hillsborough Road. I could smell him and I could see the way his, his jeans broke over the tops of his boots. Ah. Um, and it's so interesting to me how this book spends so much time questioning the idea of selfhood and integrity um, and, how, and how you can have a stable self or if you can, when your circumstances change. It's something that Charlie, I think, really struggles with. Um, and I wonder how you went about creating these extremely believable characters um, who are at the same time not, that you, they, I am so sure of who they are. I know exactly who they are, but they don't know. So I wonder what your process is in, in, in that regard. Well, I mean, you just said it. We know people like this, right? Right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not Charlie and I'm nothing like him, but I can certainly relate to, you know, going to college and walking into a dorm room and seeing this guy with the boots and, and the whole, you know, just this incredible confidence that I'd never felt in my life. And, and uh, you know, this who, who talks that way, like, hey, bud, you know, and and just doesn't, you know, just seems to be a kind of, you know, what seemed to me at the time to be a sort of, you know, archetype of, you know, the sort of ideal Southern masculinity. Plus he's, you know, you know, got a trust fund and, you know, he's super cool and he's great looking and he's got bird dogs and, you know, he can hunt and fish and do all the rest of that stuff. And for me, being nothing like that, being kind of, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, trying to hide my, my insecurities and my, my sort of nerdiness and my, my sense of, uh, you know, lacking the kind of masculinity that I wanted so badly to have when I was at that age, you know, I'd lock on to guys like that and, just kind of follow them around like puppy dogs. And then after a couple of years, when I, you know, grew up and read a few books and got a little deeper and understood the world a little better, I realized and got to know them a little better and realized how, you know, kind of chipped they were and how flawed they were and how, you know, they weren't, you know, what I wanted them to be. They were just human beings uh, with a lot of, um, baggage and and difficulties and dysfunction in their families and and you know shame that they were carrying and insecurities of their own i realized that you know they had never maybe some of them maybe one of them in particular wanted everybody to think that they were you know what i wanted them to think but but that was my choice to to put them on that post and i think that that's what Charlie does is that, you know, he, he sees in Arch, you know, a kind of vessel for his dreams of what he would want to be. And in Vanessa, who, you know, I think hopefully, you know, develops her own, you know, humanity and, and depth by the end of the novel, but to Charlie at first is, is, is the woman on the pedestal, right? Uh, that's what he does to them. And, and so, you know, I think when I, what I was doing was I was, you know, kind of grappling with my own, you know, sort of nostalgia or memory of how delusional I was about what, you know, what one should aspire to or, or, you know, who I was putting my, uh, my faith or my loyalty in and why it wasn't that they were necessarily on, you know, the bad people or anything like that, but that the reasons why I was investing them with that were, were very superficial and, and, and naive reasons. Um, and then 
uh, I think that I, I, I wanted to also make sure that I didn't write a story in which this was just some sort of vicious critique of, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, kind of love, hate, guilty pleasure where we're just peering into the lives of the affluent and then tearing them down and showing how, I mean, I didn't want to, uh, Kathy actually recommended me. I don't know if you've seen Succession, that TV show on HBO. It's so good. I know, right? And she said that, that it, you know, the book reminded her of Succession. And I was like, my people are not that bad, are they? And she's like, no, 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 but it's just, the yacht and the house and you know, I was like, okay, okay. Uh, but I didn't want to, you know, to show, I didn't want it to be some sort of tear down of, of people who just happen to be extremely wealthy or, or entitled. I, I wanted to, it to be a, a, an objective depiction of that world. And I also want, felt that it was necessary if I was going to do that, that the person that I was bringing into it not be pure. Yeah. That he be, you know, kind of a little bit of a jerk, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I hope he comes off okay by the end, but he, he there's a bitterness in him and the envy and the spite and the, the cynicism the lack of self-acceptance that Charlie has, uh, I felt was really important to show that there are no heroes here. Like I said before, he's, he's not pure and he's not uh, free of fault in any of this by a wide margin. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you know, I felt that it would be a better, um, a fairer and a truer story about you know just exactly what we were talking about before that that nobody is all good or all bad but everybody is a little good and a little bad and the devil take the hind one. Yeah, I I think that I think that you really do accomplish it. I mean, if there's no heroes, there are no villains in this book either. I had enormous sympathy for all of them. Um, that we are, I mean, it we are all victims of our circumstances, whether they be good or bad. Um, and we only do the best we can with our humanity. Um, I have a couple of questions in the chat here um, about process, and I, I'll read them to you both sort of at once. Um, our fellow Al Algonquin author, Chris Swan, is here. Oh, hey, Chris. Um, and he would like to know how your novels begin with concept, voice, or image. Landra Larson also is interested in your process, um, whether you um, whether you outline, whether you map things out or let the characters lead. Um, I'll answer the second question first. I um, the um, I'd, I'd say kind of the two writers that that I most kind of idolized when I first decided I wanted to be a writer were Walker Percy and John Irving, weirdly enough, even though I don't know that there's much resemblance between what I do and, and what John does. Uh, I wish I could write like him, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I have that big an imagination. But he write, John writes like these really, really detailed outlines. Like he won't even write the first sentence until he writes the last sentence first and he writes you know, like, you know, everything out, like really, really, like he's got it all figured out before he even starts to compose the prose. And apparently this has always been his method. Walker Percy said in interviews that he doesn't plan anything. He just, you know, starts with uh, a scene and a voice and a character and just goes and sees where they, where they're going to lead him. And I think that I've tried to come up with a method that is a little bit of both where I got to have a decent sense of where I'm going to end and how I'm going to get there. But I don't want to know more than that because, you know, part of the pleasure is, is inventing or, or really not even inventing, but allowing yourself to get to know your characters in a way that they start making their own decisions and not in a sort of, you know, spooky metaphysical way, but in a, a sense of you think about the logic of the way they've they've become drawn in your mind uh, 
uh, and what they would do. And I have had experiences where kind of what I thought I was going to do or what I wanted to do, I couldn't, I was like, no, he would never do that. This is not something that, that Arch would say, or, or this is not characteristic. I, it would be inconsistent. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And so they do in that sense, make their own choices and their own decisions. And I like that because that's a really, you know, that part of the process of writing is really invigorating when you feel like the story is writing itself. Um, I think that where I begin usually is, um, you know, with, with characters, uh, just, you know, my, my protagonist and the thing that he, or the person that most impacts him. And I, I feel like in all of my stories, they're, they're primarily, even though I like to make a lot of things happen, they're relationship driven. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, how, you know, we, you know, how I've been shaped and formed by the people that I really adore and care about and have influenced me both positively and negatively. Some of the people that I love the most in the world have not been a very good influence on me necessarily. And it's taken me a long time to, you know, you know, when I reflect on those relationships, I look at, okay, well, why did I do that? Or, or um, what did I learn from that? And, and I can still love a person and recognize that maybe they weren't necessarily good for me. Um, and, uh, so I get interested in that, and I, I I usually start to think about primarily like you know what are what are the big sort of formative relationships that are that are interesting to me. So really, I kind of think where I started with this one uh, was just imagining these two boys encountering each other who were so vastly different. And one who has all the confidence and the assurance and the power and the and and the the the, the sense of, of certainty, and the other who is you know deeply desperate to belong somewhere, and what's going to happen when I put them together, and uh, see where it goes from there. That's that's how I started. Makes sense. And do you um, do you do a lot of research? Um. um well it's funny and, and i've said this before that part of, I, I didn't mention this when when you asked me why i you know wanted to write a set the book in nashville but you know some of it was just you know a, a little bit of laziness like you know i wouldn't have to do a lot of research because i live here i can drive around and i can talk to people and uh you know i don't have to like get out you know google maps or something like that to figure out you know what's next to this that, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, and maybe it's not fair to myself to say laziness, but given the way that my life is, I have young children, you know, I have a full-time job and, and I just don't have the luxury of, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to take a month and go to this city and really get to know it so that I can write about it. Um, but then once I made that choice, I did have to do a lot, not, not a huge ton, but a significant amount of research because I didn't live here when the novel was set. Right. And I had to go back and, and it's so different, you know, from, from, you know, uh, from when I said it and, and I had to make sure I got all this stuff right. I'm fortunate that I have a couple of close friends who are Nashville natives and historians and, and they really, you know, I have one friend in particular that if you ask him a question about the history of Tennessee, any part of Tennessee, he'll tell you the answer to the question and then tell you five more completely fascinating and mesmerizing facts that you didn't know and would probably want to write a novel about. And so I, I had some people to lean on. Uh, and I do enjoy doing that, but a lot of that ends up for me being kind of stuff that happens after I've done what I consider to be the real work, which is, is drawing the characters and the conflicts. And then I have to go back and make sure that I didn't forget that, you know, on this particular date, something dramatically significant happened. Like, oh yeah, no, this is the day the tornado blew through East Nashville. You can't have that be the day that, you know, the boys go fishing or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that's fun though, to learn about that. Kind of stuff, so I didn't mind it. Yeah. 
you get into the nasty guts of a senatorial campaign. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I assume you didn't have firsthand experience of that, though. <laughs> no, but uh, um, I am a politics junkie and I, I, I read about it all the time and I, I, I read books about, you know, campaigns and those sorts of things. And I think it's, you know, it's fairly accurate. Uh, I hope, I don't know. I, at least, I hope it at least comes across as being believable, but no, I have had no up close encounters though. I've certainly had, you know, like encounters with political figures uh, just through my work and, and through writing and doing events where these folks show up and, um, you know, I'm always kind of like, oh, wow, well, you know, Senator over there, you know, <laughs> uh, but I had to, that did have to research that stuff. I, I, I'm not an insider. That's cool. Um, I think one of the things that I found really pleasurable about, about this book is very simple. It's just the fact that this unspools in a perfectly novelistic way as a memory from a beautiful retrospective perch. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my, the novel I'm writing right now, I've somehow wrenched myself into thinking that it has to be in present tense, which is just, it makes me cringe. Um, I've, I've gotten there though. Well, that's what, is that why you read the movie goer? Cause he does the present tense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I do think that there's a, there's an interesting relationship between memory um, and um, the novel. Um, this book is so much about the past, um, about um, tradition and origin and what we keep and what we leave behind. And I wonder if you thought of, of the past or of memory as a theme in this, in this novel um, or how it motivated it. Absolutely. And I can tell you exactly why. Um, I, I'm very flattered and, uh, you know, really touched that people have compared this book to The Great Gatsby. And I can see that now having been, had, have that pointed out to me uh, when I look back into it, that I had obviously internalized that book and, and that a lot of the things that I was writing about were borrowed from it. But honestly, I never thought about The Great Gatsby once in the time that I was writing this novel. The novel I was thinking about, which is a lot of similarities, was Brideshead Revisited by Waugh. Mm -hmm. And I think there's even a line, uh, maybe near the beginning of the second part of that book, where the narrator says, my theme is memory. Mm -hmm. And it's you know very much the, the, the structure of the story I, I borrowed uh, I, I wanted to write like that, where th that story begins with this guy, he's in the army, it's World War II, and they're kind of doing training camps around England, and and they move in the middle of the night, and they set up the tents, and he wakes up the next morning and walks outside and looks up, and he realizes that he's, this is a place that he knows, it's the estate of this family that he, that belonged to, uh, that, that, that his best friend in college was a member of this family that he became really, really involved with. And then he goes back and, and narrates the story of that relationship all the way through to the very, you know, tragic end of his time in as a kind of a part of that family. And I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to write, you know, a cross between all the King's Men and Brides Had Revisited, set in the relatively recent contemporary American South, because I just see around me all the time so many echoes of both of those novels, just in the world that I'm living in and what's going on in, in, in the culture and the news. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that kind of, you know, half nostalgic, half you know, caustically bitter reflection on the past uh, was, you know, really inspired by Law, whose narrator also is, you know, at once in love with and deeply critical of the world that he's describing. And I was like, that's what I want to show. Yeah. 
I, I think you, I think you succeed at that. Um, and it comes through in the prose too. There's this polished, um, nature to the language of the book that um, called me back to all those masterpieces. Um, though I, I must say, Bryce had revisited moved me so much and made me so angry that I threw it against the wall in an airport. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which part? Um, oh, it was the end. I was mad at them for being so Catholic or something. I can't oh, yeah, me too. Now. I, that didn't, I didn't, I didn't buy that. I didn't, I, I, but, uh, it's still beautiful. It's very beautiful. That's probably why I was so mad at it. Um, uh, we don't have too much time left. We have three questions that I will try to just kind of bundle up in a little package. They're all about the difficulty of our present moment. Um, and I think that um, about anti-racist book clubs and and how hard it's been to to be with other with other humans of in our social circles and um, and in our families during these times of political unrest and um, and you know incredible stress um, and so I wonder I wonder what you feel the role of literature is during times like these. I think that literature's role never changes, but it becomes more intensely important in times like these. And for me, that role, uh, the, the role of the novel, the novel is a mirror. Mm -hmm. I had a professor and I've kind of stolen this from him because I think it's one of the smartest things anybody ever told me about, you know, how to think about novels. He said in the course one time, he said, I've spent, you know, all of my life trying to understand what novels teach us when I finally came to the conclusion that novels don't teach us anything. They show us what we already knew. Yeah. And, and they articulate for us what we'd felt and what we'd sensed. And they help to help us to define and shape our, 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 our sense of the world as well as our own identities. And so when you read a novel, and I don't think that nonfiction can do this. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be reading, you know, these really important nonfiction books. Uh, well, a memoirs can, and, you know, personal narratives can, but, you know, these kind of textbooks that have, you know, been so popular as people are, are trying to, to grapple with, you know, how do I, you know, like overcome these biases that, that I've grown up with. Uh, absolutely, people should read those books. Uh, but you don't read a novel, you know, you don't read Moby Dick to learn about whaling. If you want to learn about whaling, you read a book about whaling. Right. If you, you read Moby Dick to learn about the sublime, mm -hmm. right? And to understand, you know, something about yourself and the way that you respond to someone who is on a kind of, who's in a war with God, right? And, you know, what I hope, you know, what I want people to, to, to do when they read anything that I write is what I want to do when I read a novel, which is to, you know, to see myself in it, to discover what I already knew, but could not articulate for myself until I was able to react against a world created for me a human being characters whose uh, you know lives and thoughts and ideas and motivations are made plain in language movies can't do it either I love movies but language is 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 the thing God lives in language there's a reason that Jesus was a storyteller right and I, I think that that that's uh, that's it. That's, you know, you don't go into it with an agenda. You let it allow you to see yourself and to articulate for yourself, you know, what you already knew, but, you know, we're not yet able you know, to realize, to, to kind of have this, this curtain pulled back, you know, over yourself, you know, from to, to show yourself. And I think that that is, you know, um, 
that's hard to do right now for people because we're all so very you know, anxious and you know have such a sense of urgency to do something or to you know correct something or to uh, understand these things that are incomprehensible to us because you know the world now feels as unstable as it has in my lifetime. But I do think we can give ourselves permission uh, to immerse ourselves in a work of art and understand that in doing so, we're not taking a break from the reality of the world, we're doing a different kind of work. And just trust that it will happen in a way that you know, may be more instructive than anything else that you could do. That's beautifully put, and I think Thank you. exactly right. Thank you. Um, I think that we um, are almost out of time, and I can't imagine where we go from here. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you so much for for speaking with me, Ed, and thank you for writing this book. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Morgan. It's been an honor. And thank you to the Atlanta History Center and to Acapella Books. And um, I would just say to uh, folks who've joined up with us, uh, please support these businesses and these uh, local institutions, uh, not only for the gift of giving you the opportunity to hang out with, uh, with us tonight, but uh, for their survival for the future. Um, it's a really important thing. I hope you will buy my book and read it and love it. I hope you will buy Morgan's book and read it and love it. Uh, but whether you do or don't buy a book from a cappella and go to the Atlanta History Center and, and the Margaret Mitchell House and you know support these things so that they'll be there uh, when we finally are able to be together and put our arms around each other again. May that be soon. Air hugs. Thank you.